Welcome to MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Soccer Player Development Podcast. Discover all the secrets, hints and tips about soccer player development and soccer coaching from some of the leading figures in world soccer. Here's your host, Saul Isaacson Hurst. What's happening, guys? Welcome back to another show. This week we've got a fantastic guest for you. It's Zeb Jacobs, who is currently the head of coaching at Rangers Football Club, Rangers, Glasgow Rangers FC. And uh, listen, um, you know, I love doing all the podcasts I do, but then occasionally you get one of this that comes on and you just go, wow. Uh, this guy is top, proper, top practitioner, top, proper, top coach. Uh, really get into the detail. Uh, he's a real big advocate of the 1v1 duel and outplaying and the real quality technical program, the individual ball mastery, obviously a passion of mine. So this is one of the reasons I started this podcast was to, to chat and learn from people like this who you know, are real you know, leaders in this field. And so really interesting chat. Like I said, we get into the nitty gritty of his work at Rangers. Obviously, he used to work at uh, Royal Antwerp before, which is really interesting where he you know, really cut his teeth. But really spent a lot of time talking about the nitty gritty of his methodology and how to produce those technical footballers who can outplay uh, opposition in all areas of the pitch. So like I said, a real top, top episode. I'm glad you enjoy it. I really, really, really enjoyed this one and just uh, privileged that Zeb came on and we got to chat, got to speak to him because obviously he's a very busy man with his new role at Rangers. But listen, like I said, enjoy this one and keep tuned for more. Like I said, we're going for one a week. So uh, got lots more coming up for you, but uh, enjoy and I'll see you soon. So Zeb Jacobs, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Uh, can you give us a brief uh, outline of your playing and coaching journey up to this point? Of course, it's not a long outline or a long brief because I'm only 26. Um, when I was young, I stopped playing, of course, like all of us did um, in the local club. Um, but I went after, I think, five years to Royal Antwerp in that time, was a second division club as a player. Um, and I went to the... Um, in Belgium, we have like five foot elite schools. That means we have five performer schools in the country. I went to one of them. I played for the national teams and I went to Kave Mechelen. Um, but at the end, I didn't become a pro. So what you're aiming for your whole academy life, the whole time you're younger, you're aiming for that one goal is becoming a professional football player. And from one day to the other, <clears throat> it's like you're smashing a wall. You can become a pro. So what's next? The aim that you had all your life disappeared. Um, so I start studying youth criminology um, and start training my boys club again. And when I found out that my qualities were communication, building relationships, and being there with children and with younger guys, I feel that this maybe could be something for me. So I started doing my licenses, went up and up and up. And then I started my first um, coaching in an elite environment in KV Mechelen, was the first division team, also well known in Europe, with a big history in Europe. And was that responsible for the um, under 11s, under 10s, under 12s, under 13s? It did, did a lot of different roles, also something about the technical development. Um, and then a very interesting project came up. Antwerp has the biggest history at that moment in the club. It's the first club in Belgium, but it was nothing at the moment. It was not even hot water. So it had a big fan base. It was a big club, but it was nothing. So there came a new president, um, literally with a big bag of money, and he rebuilt the whole club. And one of his... KPIs, of course, was also the academy. But because there was nothing, it was a very interesting period and a challenging period for me to go there. So in the beginning, no of my, nobody of my environment um, understand why I would go there because there was nothing. But the interesting part was there was really like a white paper that we could fill in together. So there became a new academy director. I came as head of development. Um, so we all together, we, we looked in the mirror a lot, but we also start looking out of the window, what are other clubs doing and what can we implement? Because the advantage we had before the clubs, we didn't have a history we need to take, um, we need to be aware of. We just was like, how can we build here in Antwerp um, a real talent hotspot again? Because if you see what type of players came from Antwerp, we talked about Nangolan, Bertonga, Dembele, um, a lot, a lot of good players came from the region Antwerp. So our question was, can we build a talent hotspot again here in Antwerp? And the other thing is, it needs to be quite short term because, of course, the president is always very, very ambitious. So it needs to be short term. So it was a real challenging, interesting period where I've learned, learned a lot. Visit clubs like Alok Marua, um, visit clubs like Grasso Pasurich, um, inspired by, by people as 
Michael Bale, but also as people as uh, Timo Janosko is now technical director in Fiji. So surrounding myself by those type of people and being influenced to pick their brain and ideas and see what we can implement to build again um, a world leading academy in Antwerp. So uh, that was a very interesting period. And then of course, um, because you surround yourself by those type of interesting people, because I like to be influenced, I like to share ideas. That's also why I'm, I'm here you know, on this podcast. Um, I met Michael Bill and we discussed a lot about player development and um, this role in Rangers today came available. And um, he called me one day and said, are you interested to make a presentation and see where we can get and see if this is something for you? And I said, of course, um, made a presentation, how I look at development, how I see player development, how I believe the future generation of football players can be prepared. And um, so this happened and today I'm here. I'm very happy. Here you are. Here, here <laughs> so I that's am. fantastic. So then let's just wind back a bit. Let's talk about the Royal Antwerp um, role. That was really interesting. So what was your, what was your, your job title and, and your responsibilities yes. exactly there? The, the exact job title, of course, changed in, change the year because you always restructure and you always look what can be better. So I'm not going to talk especially about the job title, but I'm going to talk more about the job role. Um, and the job role was everything that, that can be better. Can you get an eye on it? And can you try to get it better? If we talk about developing or high potential players in the later age group, can you get them more attention? Um, because in Belgium, there's a real war on talent. So the question was, how can we protect our player? Because of course, if you're a building academy and you've not, not the the environment yet what other clubs has in Belgium, a lot of players leave very fast to other clubs. So one of the one of my KPI was can you get an eye on our best performers today? Even we don't know they're the highest potential players in the future, but can you get an eye on them to sort of make sure that they stay? Can you build a, a game model? Can we have a clear identity through all the age group, how we want to play, how we want to train, how we want to develop? Um, so all those things, can you develop an identity in terms of uh, how our training behaviors looks like? Can you give an identity in how our entry player looks like? So all these things, um, developing, creating and implementing was such an interesting period for me because, of, again, um, I truly believe in looking out the window and truly believe in steel like an artist because if other clubs are doing a very, very good job, why not come together and see make a mix of best methods? Um, so it was a very interesting period and it was a very wide role for me because I was involved in a lot of different topics. Um, what at my age was very interesting for my development and very exciting. Can you, can you give us some of, some of the ideas, some of those some details and some of those ideas that you've, you brought together and created to, to have in that game model and the identity and that sort of thing? One of, one of, one of the first things we did was um, we developed like a technical curriculum through all the age groups, what we called the fundamentals. Um, but we have the clear idea what how do how how these fundamentals looks like, what type of fundamentals do you have, how do we train them, how do we progress, but also where do we train them? So if I talk how do we train the fundamentals, <clears throat> I believe there is place in the academy for unopposed practice. The only thing is how do you implement unopposed practice? So we had a clear idea about unopposed practice to develop the fundamentals. So what we did is we created challenges in terms of we train once a week on um on the parking so we don't go on the grass but because we want to have different undergrounds we train with small size balls so we train with size one we train with bigger balls um also our analyzes were based on the execution of a decision um so a clear idea of how those fundamentals looks like and if we talk about what are the fundamentals and <clears throat> it goes from how to receive under pressure and escape under pressure to outplay uh, the 2v1 with the three rules of 2v1 you, we can use the back door the front door so all those types of fundamentals how can you outplay your direct opponent and which toolbox do you need to outplay um, your opponent so we had a clear idea how this build up through the age group from the younger age group in a very playful way when they get older it was more like a blocked way and when they get older it was how can you start implementing this in your game um, so that was one of the first things we did um, can, you, can you just can you sorry interrupt because that's really interesting what you're talking about can you just give an idea then for example the under nines what would that look like in the under nines then that sort of technical program so we had we had on the football department we had three lines we had one line was um we want to develop how you say in english we want to develop the best movers in the country the second line is we want to develop the fundamentals and the third line is we want to play as a royal Antwerp team so if you'd see in the in the blocks of a training session for the youngest age group creating the best movers with and without the ball was the main goal. 
because we believe that the better you move, the better you learn, and the better you move, the better you play. So a training session, for example, for an under nine age group was mostly play, 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 and play the game, but also just play with the different type of sports, with the tagging games. We create, we create like a challenging environment where children could explore. Um, so in the under nine age group, it was all about play and make sure when those kids arrive on the pitch, they don't want to leave the pitch. It's like we always say a session needs to be, if you look back when you're at school and you, you were going to an amusement park today, you wake up and you get a feeling in your stomach that you're going to do something very nice at school. This is the feeling that we want to create every session again, especially when you're in the nine group, it needs to be play, 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 play. Um, they could explore it was more like the coach is responsible for creating an environment where children could explore and of course there was time because we care about the amount of ball contact we care about the quality of contact but also the amount of contact so of course there was place for unopposed skill boxes and what is a skill box a skill box is literally just a square where every player has his own ball and gets challenged during levels if it's about juggling levels it's about skills we created some skills and a lot of discussion was some type, some skills were not um, maybe used in the game, but we believe that a type of street football skills make sure that we develop hip flexibility, ankle flexibility, and a relationship with the body ball. So we did a lot of skills that maybe looked a bit, a little bit strange, also in terms of juggling. We did types of juggling that maybe looks a little bit strange, but we believe that it's to develop the body ball relationship, but also it's a part of coordination because I don't believe in like the letters, but you need to tap through the letters. I believe give a player a ball and do a lot of touches that you have the same result, but the advantage is we're using a ball. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. That's one of my pet peeves. I'm not a fan of ladders either. And it's good to hear that you guys are doing do all those stuff with the ball. That's really interesting. So then, so then, so like for example, the skill, you know, you have like a base of skills, the coach teaching them skills. I mean, you talked about, you know, relating it to receiving under the pressure and escaping under pressure. So were, were they already teaching those skills as well? Um, 100%, 100%. And to, 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 to create a little bit like a, like a, um, a structure in my story is um, what we have implemented in ranges to structure the moment if we talk about our playing, if we talk about an opposed practice, if we talk about a body ball relationship, if we talk about game inside, we have created, um, or I create like a house of player development. And the house of player development um, is for us very helpful because it's a clear picture how we want to develop the future generation of ranger players. So if you see the house of player development and the younger you are, the lower you are, the lower you are in the house. And everything starts again with the body ball relationship. How good is your relationship with the ball? Are you literally going to sleep with the ball in your bed? Do you love the ball? Does the ball love you? Can you manipulate as much as you want in the direction you want? Can you juggle? So that's the first layer. If you go to the, the, to the second layer or the, or, or the first floor, then you come into technique. And technique means we divide it in releasing techniques, receiving techniques, and moving techniques. So techniques become more in context with a direction with or without an opponent. The next layer is the outplaying. <clears throat> Can you outplay alone or in combination? The next player is game inside. So it's based on position, moment, direction, and speed because every decision is related to those five time and space characteristics. And the above is the roof. And the roof is our game model. And the game model makes sure that we all have the same identity. But if you see the younger you are, the lower you are in the house, the higher you up, the higher you are in the house, the see the older you get, the more important the game model becomes. And the lower you are, the more important the ball becomes. And then you have two pillars on the side of the house, what is the mind and the body, because the mind and the body are always involved in whatever we do. There is always a mind topic. It's about concentration, it's about resilience, it's about motivation, whatever. And always a body topic, because when, the moment we play, our body is involved. So a clear idea of how we want to build a range of players under the roof as a game model because the game model makes sure that we all have the same identity no matter which jersey we wear is it under nine and the ten and the sixteen we will have the same characteristics during the game but if we talk about play development it's about everything what we do below so at the end they can execute our principles in the best possible way so again it starts with the purest form of the ball you and the ball in skill boxes that's why every session is a 10 minute of skill box every session because if we believe that ball is the most important pillar of academy because we speak we speak about four pillars we speak about ball game body mind if we believe that ball is the most important pillar of the academy and at the end to perform at the highest level we need to make sure that your time on the ball is every session there 
I truly believe in consistency. It's so stupid. But if you want to get your teeth white, you don't have to brush once. You have to brush twice every day. That's the only way to get comfortable in manipulate the ball in all circumstances. So every session until the age of under 14 has a skill box. No discussion. Every session, even a warming up, because we see the warming up for the game also as a training session. So that's the first part. The second part is the technique. Receiving skills, releasing skills, moving skills. <clears throat> And this is just important because if you want to play, if you want to combine alone in combination, it's about unopposed handling the ball. The second flow is about outplaying alone in combination. And we divide it, it can be frontal, sideways, uh, back to goal, or with an angle. So an outplaying again, alone in combination, that, that's why 2v1 is so important for us. 2v1 is the first phase of decision making. Do I outplay alone or do I use my teammates to combine? Then we come to gaming side, gaming side based on position, moment, direction, and speed. And that all happens under a game model, of course, with the four phases of the game, attacking, defending, and the two transition moments. And now we have the two pillars. So it's right, give up. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, because you just get a, you, there's so much there to unpack. So I'm going to try and wind back there because there's loads of, I want to I get all the detail, all the, all the juicy bits, as we say in, in England. All well, the great detail. So just talk a bit about the outplay. And then you talked about the four different, you talked about front or in the back on the side and diagonal. Talk about that. What does that look like then? How do how if I'm a coach, how am I delivering that? Uh, for example, in the under 11s, I mean, do I break it down into you know each topics each year or do I do, do I just go with it? How does that look like? What does that look like in practice? First, we want to create the best out players in the world. That's the main ambition. And why? Look, if you see as I'm um, first going to start why our playing is so so important and such a big part of our academy. If you see how the game is evolving, and if we see um, that the game is evolving to a game where time and space is getting less and less and less and less and less. And in development, we have to ask two main questions: How does a talent looks today, and how will the professional player looks like in the future? And how does a professional player looks like in the future is so difficult to predict. So we can make sure that we develop adaptable players who can perform in a future game, no matter how the game will be played. So if we break down the KPIs of a future-proof player who can perform in whatever how the game will develop, our playing is number one. Because no matter how the game will be played, if you dominate your opponent at all the times, you will play in a future game, no matter how the game will be played. So if we talk about our playing, I believe every session is in our playing session. Every session is in our playing session. What does that mean? Of course, we have principles and we have a season plan in our, in our uh, academy, so we know exactly what we want to train. But outplaying is um, a term to beat the opponent. Again, what I've said in the four different angles, and it can be alone and it can be in combination. And if we talk about building up a training session, mostly and everybody um, is talking about it in doing it in a progressive way. That means maybe first you're doing something opposed, then you dribble a line defender, then it becomes a defender in the square, then it becomes an active defender, and then it becomes like a game. That's how we all use to build up training sessions. What we do, and one of our training principles is a variation. I want that our coaches sometimes just throw a grenade in the session and maybe start with a 4v4 and then break it down in the other way around and going back to the 4v4. It's some a term of retrieval practice that first we solve a problem, then we teach them how you can solve the problem and then you can solve the problem on your own again. So how you create an outplaying session can be very various and I hope it's various every session again. Um, because also if players know what's gonna happen and we always build the session the same way, they're not at open to learn anymore. So what I would like to do, if, if we talk about the ideal training week, we talk about day one, they start with the game, then they go in 1v1, then they go in unopposed, they go to 1v1 and the game again. So if like a various buildup, the second session, we start very unopposed, moves to beat your opponent, mannequin to 1v1, to 2v2, to overload, 3 versus 2, to a game. So just make sure that every session has a different session in terms of problem solving. Our playing is nothing else than problem solving. And we have two tasks. One, make sure that all players recognize the patterns to beat your opponent because the best players are the best pattern recognitions. So we talk about the hip ankles, the knee ankles, uh, the ankle um, angles, cues, so I need to say cues, the hip cues, ankle cues, knee cues, the better the, the our players can read the opponent, the better they outplay. So that's why opposed practice is the most of a curriculum. 
What does it mean again that unopposed has no place? Because if we talk about a body ball relationship, if we talk about moves to beat the opponent, if we talk about releasing skills, moving skills, uh, receiving skills, there is place for unopposed practice. But again, how do you train those unopposed practice? So if we talk about our playing, our playing is such a bigger picture and it's a combination of teaching a toolbox that allows players to outplay and to bring them in situations that they need to problem solve, make decisions, read the opponent, read the situation. If that makes sense. And probably I'm going too, too fast, but... No, no, and I'm just curious, just so for example, then how would, you, how would you break down the session then in terms of how long is how long would you work on each part and that sort of thing? I'm just interested in... This is also a very interesting topic um, because I think we all learned um, in every course we do in every FA, even if it's in Belgium or in Scotland or in the UK, um, is we all ask to time every session. Is do 10 minutes, then we do this 20 minutes, then we do this 30 minutes. I believe that the only people who decide how long you do a certain practice are the players. Mm. I believe the art of coaching is reading your players' learning curve. That, that sounds very difficult, and that it's very difficult, but I believe it's about focus. So if you feel that your players losing attention, switch. So in the academy, we have a rule, and uh, one of sorry, the training principle is a 3 10 30. And the three is don't more than three explicit details. Otherwise, they will choke under pressure. So make sure that in your details, whatever you will train, if we talk about our playing, give us three explicit details that you're going to teach. It's about maybe a move to beat the opponent, how to use your body. It's about acceleration after you beat them. And it's about keep your head up because maybe you need um, to outplay, you need your teammate. The 10 is after 10 minutes, change something small in your drill. So to keep the brain on their toes all the time in the session, and the 30 is um, make sure you keep your intervention under 30 seconds. So if you ask me how does a session looks like, <coughs> I hope I can answer. We have a clear idea how we want to train, and that's what's the most important thing. So we have a objective season plan. We know what to train. We know how to train. But if we talk about the right timing, it always depends on age group. It depends on learning curve. It depends on the quality of your team, how fast they go to a certain thing. Because if we believe that development is non-linear, we can have a linear approach with a non-linear development. So we need to make sure that our training sessions are always variable. We go from games opposed to unopposed to opposed. We have a lot of 1v1 sessions. I can make sure that our curriculum is all based on creating the best out players in the world. So that means every session has a skill box for at least 10 minutes. That's the only time that's divided in front. So every session has a skill box. But then how they build up the session, maybe they start with the game, maybe they start unopposed, maybe they start with 1v1s, maybe they start with an overload and go back to 1v1s. So we want to make sure that how we build the session is variable to keep the brain on their toes all the time. And I know in Belgium, we say a lot, a session is like writing a book. You have a title, that's the topic of the session. Then you have an intro you're, you're, and you're building, up, you're building up, you're building up, you're building up, you're building up. So you have like a clear build up in the session. And I know that sounds very nice, but I do truly believe that not the best way um, to develop players. So if we know that problem solving before the problem is teach or the solution is teach, learned and um, results in better learners. If we know that unpredictability opens the brain, attention and focus, what leads to better learning. If we know that autonomy and play and decision-making and pattern recognition is a KPI for future performance, then we need to give them problems. We need to make them and find solutions in different situations. So if we all know this, we need to be honest with ourselves and we need to make sure that our sessions are delivered in a very variable way to keep the brain on the toes all the time. And, and to tell me a bit about outplaying um, in the YDP and the PDP, for example, then what does that look like? And they talk, you know, I assume it's position specific. Yes. So, <clears throat> I like the position specific term. Um, and the question is what, is, a, what is the age you can decide a position? I think that's a very discussion, what is also very common, in, I think, in every academy. And what we've seen is the moment players go to the PDP, you prepare them for professional football. And again, also, it's not because in PDP and the game model becomes more important that our playing disappears. I think we have some very good coaches. If we talk about Cameron Campbell, or under 18 coach, who is so good in training our playing in his game model, in his principle. Because if we believe, again, that our playing is the future um, of our playing, make sure that players can perform in however the game will evolve, 
it's true the whole curriculum outplaying is more like an identity than a real topic. So outplaying is implemented in foundation phase, in youth phase, but even in PDP. And we talk about individual player targets. So outplaying is also on every position, in every moment of the game. So IPT as a fullback, uh, outplaying as a fullback is different as a center back. Outplaying as a midfielder with pressure from behind is different than outplaying as a winger who's front of, uh, facing a 1v1 in the front hallway. So outplaying is evolved in the curriculum during the week, during the season, during the month, but also IPTs that um, individual player target, the players decide for themselves with the help of the coaches and trained during the week. Um, outplaying is also implemented in those type of individual sessions. <clears throat> and I mean, I don't want to come, I want to, so I don't want to leave uh, more land to so soon because we'll talk more but just I mean so for example though going into a new club and a new footballing culture and um, you know what, what were the challenges in terms of then implementing you know a 1v1 philosophy in an academy with you know UK coaches where it's, it's not you know there's most most academies don't do it you don't you won't find any out plan stuff in any UK you know English FA course do you know what I mean so what was what were the challenges surrounding that I think the starting point is completely different. If you see the environment, Belgium is producing top players. And that's not because we have top environments. If you go to the most elite clubs and you see the amount of pitches, the luxury um, is really not that good. If I came to Rangers, our training center is amazing. But if you go to all the top clubs, the training center, the amount of pitches is huge. Every team has its own pitch. So if you talk about our playing in 1v1s, if you are with four teams on one pitch, that makes that you will start training in small side. That makes you will start training 1v1s. So what was once a disadvantage for Belgium, the amount of money, the training facility, the environment, turned up in a big, big advantage because we, we almost always train small side. We really care about 1v1s. We train on the parking ground. And all of this is such a big difference. And I believe that because in the UK, I think the best academies have such an amount of nice pitches, and of course, you need to have a good environment to produce top players. But it also makes that coaches become sometimes lazy because they have a big pitch, they can use big sided because they always can use the whole team. And I believe where I came from in the clubs I work, we always or mostly we need to share a pitch with four different age groups. So that automatically comes in 1v1s, 2v2s, 3v3s. So we automatically produce the best out players if you see it to a national first, um, first team. Also, I think, yeah, but I think also culturally, right? I think, you know, in terms of, you know, England, US, British football, excuse me, Great Britain, you know, England, Scotland, very direct, generally looking back, you know, quick movement of the ball, possession type football, you know, possession type. I, mean, I look at the academies I work with, with exceptions now, the place, you know, uh, I've been recently, but I mean, very much based around the team, you know, coaching the team, particularly in the older age groups. And, you know, and judging the success and how they do in the game on the weekends. So then how do you, my, that's my question is, how do you, you know, how do you, do you challenge that? And then how do you still, how do you, how are you upskilling these coaches into, you know, all this outplaying, you know, technical and tactical information? Yeah. Um, very good question. First, I'm going to start. Um, I think Belgium has the advantage because also, of course, whole the world is influenced by Johan Cruyff, but also Belgium is influenced by Johan Cruyff. And there's one quote that's so valuable that is, Teams don't learn, individuals within the team learn, and individuals don't, uh, teams don't break through in the first team. It's only an individual breakthrough in the first team. So <clears throat> to have a starting point that individual is the basis of everything what we do, I think there are two very important things. And one is if you make one coach on one team, he becomes responsible for his team. So I have one, I have my team and I need to develop my team. So what you see is we work in ranges with a lot of hybrid groups. So that makes sure that coaches don't feel responsible for a team, but co coaches make responsible for players because they don't have a clear team. Then they train the under 13s and a hybrid group 15, 16. So to make sure that it's fluent and that they're responsible for all the players. And the second thing is <clears throat> what was very, very um, interesting. Before I came to Rangers, um, and there is a difference between talking about individual player development and our playing and actually doing it. So I'll give you an example. Um, the moment I started talking with Rangers, it was all about player development, player development, player development. But the first thing I received was the game model. So if I'm a coach and I receive the game model, I automatically go to think that I need to develop the game model. But if the first thing I receive is a player development model, the first thing I would think I need to develop is the player. 
So just the starting point of where you are and what you give the information you give to your coaches will automatically, um, automatically translate to the pitch. So that's why the house of play development was so important for me. That's the first slide of our curriculum. This is how we build players and the game model is only the roof. But if, if it's the first thing I would give to the players, the game model, of course, we, we, can, we can point a finger to a coach that they develop the game, they develop a collective way, that they develop the team. We want to develop the players, we want to develop the individual at all ages. So, and then we also, of course, talk about maturity. If you talk about um, player development and individual over team and development over winning, we need to develop, uh, we need to talk about maturity. We need to develop early developer, late developer. We need to make sure that we are aware of what are the late developers, what are the early developers. And there is nothing good or wrong or bad or right. We only make, need to make sure that every player has the right environment. And then we need to come away from winning because if we have all early majors in the same age group, what I've seen in Scotland, if we play against the opponent, the early majors, the amount of early majors is so, so high with our opponent we are playing against and not in ranges. I truly believe that we have, a, we selected the right way and we are having the right way to develop um, future performance. But if you see the opponents in the games we're playing in the weekends, it's incredible how many early major players they have to win the game. So if you early see, maturated players, you mean over early match over maturated or yes. well developed bigger boys, yeah. yeah. Well, well developed bigger boys who can run, who can beat, uh, who win duels all the times. But then yeah, I'll British, start. Yes, uh, welcome to British football, <laughs> British yeah. Academy football. Exactly. And then I'll start by what, what what is the game? Do we see the game as an assessment of what we do in the week, or do we see the game as just another developing moment? Because if we see the game as an assessment during the week and it looks good and we need to win because winning is important and winning feels good and winning feels right and winning tells us that we're developing in a good way. What is not at all true, but if that is the standing point, you will automatically grab for the bigger players. Also when you're great players, but also when you're lefty, you will automatically grab to the performance of today. But performance of today is such a bad predictor of potential for the future. So um, I truly believe that um, bio bending and creating the right environment for the for, for the players, even their late major or early major, is so 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 important. Um, and, and tell us a bit about just tell us a bit about two v one then the combination you talked about the front door and the back door. Just, just tell us a bit of detail about tell that and how you're yes. coaching that. Um, so two v one front door back door was for us, um, you know, analogy. Um, Play, it's, it's a form of implicit learning, almost like unconscious learning. If you use back door, front door, side door, it's like an analogy we created in Antwerp to teach the rules of 2v1. Um, and the back door is just you make a running behind. You really took the back door of your opponent so I can play you, make a running behind. The front door, um, the front door is let your, no, sorry, I'm wrong. The back door is like an overlap. I'm going to make more easy. The back door is like an yeah. overlap. You're running the back of me. The front door is like an underlap. And the yeah. side door is just, I challenge you. I come to you. And at the last moment, I play to the side to outplay you. So those, the back door is the overlap. Uh, the front door was the underlap. And the side door was like just, we're running with two at you. And we challenge you. And at the last moment, I play to my teammates. So you are outplayed. So that's a form of analogy that we use to teach the 2v1s. Um, because we believe that the first phase of decision making is the starting point of our playing. Um, but before that, it's important that players are comfortable with our playing alone. Because if you always use a teammate, they don't become comfortable with our playing alone. So first creating enough situations where they need to outplay 1v1 in all the angles. So they're comfortable with beating the opponent in different type of situations, circumstances. And then we only add teammates in 2v1s, 3v2s, so they start lifting up their heads. They start implementing the rules of 2v1. They start picking victims so they can outplay with their teammate also. And then it's about yeah, this, decision. This is something I've talked about quite a lot, especially when I've traveled a lot and I've presented and I've seen, I've worked with players from other clubs maybe where the philosophy is very much based around possession or around rondos and that sort of thing. And you put them in a 1v1, in a dual situation, or even a 2v2, and they really struggle to solve the problem themselves because they're so used to having an overload all the time 
every exactly. single time I, I've always got a pass which is fair enough but then the problem comes when I'm un, you know um, I'm not overloaded or I'm underloaded then I've got a serious problem that's why I'm a big critic of just having too much of you know 2v1 3v1 5v2 is that something which is great but then if you don't ever have a 1v1 situation or 2v2 then you know your player is not going to be prepared for the game yeah and two things for that. I think uh, one is if we if, if you play an overload situation, if you want to play an overload, overload situation, we always start the ball on the overload side. So if you want to train overload situation, what's okay, but start the ball on the underload side. So first the underload players need to solve because of the underload, then probably the overload will take the ball and then you have your overload situation. Then, then we start in the underload, what you're saying, they need to solve a problem because they're 1v2 or 2v3. Mm. And the second thing is, our playing um, 1v1 is implemented in all the academy. And I give you an example. So of course we have our we have our, our principles, how we want to play, what creates our identity. But if you're playing a game, it can be an overload, whatever they want to train, it can be a small side. The moment the ball is out of the pitch, just play 1v1 out of the pitch until the ball is bring in. So from every team, one player can go out of the pitch and the player who brings the ball back in because they have a 1v1 when the ball is out. Me from my team, I'm going out to try to catch the ball. One player from the other opponent. So we have out, 1v1 out of the pitch, and we need to play 1v1 to bring him back in the pitch, and the game start again. Instead of the ball is out, throwing, kickings, or dribblings, just play mm. out of the pitch. It's only 1v1. So let's make sure that the amount of 1v1s is not only trained when we train 1v1, but it's trained at all the times, even when we train other topics. Yeah, interesting. And then just before we move on to, to, to your move, then you talked about moving, you know, the best movers off the ball. Does that then? How does that affect your recruitment? Are you looking? Do players have to have those physical assets, or are you taking players who maybe you know don't have that that natural speed or power on the ball? So that's a that's a very um, acute topic. If that makes sense, that means that we are at the moment we are completely on grading players. Um, um, so again, we need to start by what are the building blocks for future performance? What does we make sure that we select the right players? to come into academy. And you have some untrainable or unteachable topics like speed, just having fast fibers is something that we're searching for because we believe um, how the future game is evolving that that will be so important. What does not mean that we don't take players if they not have five fibers because maybe as a midfielder, you don't need to have that such amount of fast fiber, but fast fibers is for sure for us so important. And the other thing is what you talk about is smooth movers is the ability to twist and turn, flexibility in the hips, in the ankles, in the knees, to make sure, because if we believe in our playing, what are what is what is the skill set for our playing in terms of the physical side of our playing? It's about quickness. It's about um, the ability to twist. It's about the ability to turn. It's about the ability to act, to make an acceleration after your action. So those building blocks we are searching at the moment. And then the second question is, how can we measure them? And do we need to measure them all times? Um, because on the other hand, I truly believe in developing. I believe creating an environment where we also can train those ability to twist to turn the ability to um, have mobility in the hips by creating a day-to-day -day consistency environment where our playing is always part of i also believe that we we can create it but if you, if you talk about what type of players do we want i think we have a clear idea in how we want to play so that automatically create that we have a clear idea what type of players do we have we want to have and or more we want to create and then we select the building blocks we, we believe in um, again, fast fibers. We also believe in um, fast feet, smooth movers. So those, and we don't care about maturity. We don't care about early developers or late developers. We care about having the building blocks. And maybe an, um, an early developer had the right building blocks because there's nothing wrong with being an early developer. The same, there's nothing bad with the late developer. It's just about do you have the building blocks to come in our academy and maybe become a future performer. Interesting. So then talk about then your, I mean, you make the move uh, over the sea to, to Rangers, to Glasgow. What were your first impressions as you came into the academy and the club? And what are the differences between Rangers and Royal Antwerp? Yeah. Um, I think <clears throat> sometimes I think we have the wrong perception of, um, nee, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start again. We have the right perception of how football is played in Scotland. The only thing I can say is that Rangers is completely different. And it's not because I work there, but it's because the people who are there. Um, and of course, Michael Bill had an influence who was there and a lot of people who are there at the moment had an influence because we, the perception in Scotland of, of, of Scotland, how Scotland football is played at the moment is a lot of winning is important and we want to have the biggest guys on the pitch and the fastest guys on the pitch and we want to win and we want to have duels. 
I think range is completely on the other side. What makes that we will lose games and losing games is, 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 is doesn't matter at all in our academy or at the end, of course, everybody wants to win, but we make, want to make sure that we get in our trainers and coaches' mind that winning doesn't matter. And especially in a player, in a, uh, sorry, in a parent's head, that winning doesn't matter. But if you see the biggest difference, so in general is, if we talk about Belgium and Scotland in general, I think in Belgium, we care about how we play and how we train. And in Scotland, they care about in the win and they want to have winning and the bigger player on the pitch. So I think if you go just to do a general game in Belgium, you will see build up from the back. You will see our playing. You will see a lot of goals. You will see um, a lot of fun. If you see general games in Scotland, you will see uh, long kicks from the goalie. You will see a lot of duels. You will see pitches that are too big. You will see balls that are too big for the age groups. Um, but I'm not talking about ranges because I think believe what we are doing is we've, we're playing games on small side of pitch. We, we, we play small side tournaments. We use different type of balls. We use dribblings and kickings. So we play with constraints we control what we can control because of course the cast pitches are not uncontrollable but if you see just the biggest difference is that i believe in belgium they like to build up from the back they try um winning is not that important and if we see scotland at the moment they have the biggest guys on the pitch they kick long from the goalie and they really really care about winning so it's a cultural difference um and a very interesting difference of course yeah, because I remember that when I was, I mean, that's why I was fortunate to be at Tottenham at the time, because, you know, we had, a, you know, a, 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 you know, a more, you know, that's more of a, a, a philosophy based on uh, individual outplaying and technical excellence, the ball mastery, and that was very culturally different, and it was very much a lot of pushback from from everybody else. And one of, I was lucky, right place, right time, one of the reasons I've done so well at the academy, because I had the skill sets to to move up there. So my question to you is that, how do you do that? How do you, one, you know, find the, play, the, the coaches to, to deliver that and then again how do you you know how how do you upskill coaches all because i'm clean i'm working at club as a moment as, as a consultant doing the same thing trying to support the coaches in delivering the detail almost you know how do you how do you do that practically in a new academy environment a new football culture yeah. um very good question we select we the first one of the first things i did is we create a cpd calendar so what, what does that mean every coach have two in services every month one with, with all the coaches and one within the phases. So every phase has a monthly CPD and all the coaches have also one all together. So every co every individual coach has two CPD, um, two CPDs in a month. And the topics can be very different. The topics can be about all behavior. The topics can be about our playing. We did one about playing where it was linked to a, a demo session. I did, I did a session and afterwards we did a presentation about and we reflect on the session. Um, but also, um, I'm also not the head of coaching with a big football brain that's going to tell everybody what to do. I believe that I want to create an environment where I just connect the dots. Um, what does that mean? That, for example, the last in service for all the coaches um, or 18 or under 18, Cameron Campbell did a presentation about creating, converting the final third. So how are the most goals scored at the moment? So it's from, not from the wide areas, but from the hall spaces and cutbacks and how can we create there? So the message below us, Again, technique and our playing is so, so important because his main message from the service. So what I'm trying to say is that every service, no matter who is giving it, is with the same message. It's about developing the individual. It's about developing our players and the best ball handlers we can possibly create. But in a practical way, we are creating two CPDs every month for every coach. And beside that, um, we've created coach reports. So what does that mean? Our analyst, we have one analyst who is um, responsible for the coach development. So we film the session and then we have like a coach report. How many positive comments? How many negative comments? How many ball rolling time do you have? Um, what type of interventions do you do? What type of ex, ex, um, questions did you ask? We also divided in the coaching style, um, the art of coaching, what we call teaching on the fly. That means that you're just coaching and the session keeps going. <laughs> Freeze and teach. You stop the session. You come in between, ask questions and skillful silence. And the coach report gives us literally the numbers of the amount of freeze and teach, the amount of questions, the amount of ball rolling time, the amount of time you, you will stop the sessions. And then we start reflecting on the session. We have the footage of the session. We have the voice of the sessions. So that's make sure that we can go in depth in terms of coach development in an objective way. 
So we're not discussion about um, did things happen, but why did this happen? So that makes that our discussions are based on objective numbers, what helps coach development a lot. Uh, but I mean, so are you doing the skill, is it skill, you got skill boxes every session there? Have you, have you implemented that now? Yeah, so every skill box, uh, um, every session from the younger ages till the age of under 40, every session there is a skill box. Now, if I ask, I think 100 people in a room, where do you implement a skill box? Everybody would implement it after warming up or in the warming up. And what I'm trying to say again, if we believe that variation is key in a training process or in the way we build a training session, so they can decide where they, where they implement it. Because one, you can implement it in the beginning of the session and it's very good to use as a warm up and activate the body, activate the brain, activate the foot. But also you can use it at the end of your session because a skill box, your body ball relationship also needs to be perfect when you're tired and your brain is already overloaded after the, uh, in, during the whole session. And then you need to have time, input time on the ball. So at the, maybe you can implement at the end of the session, I would like cooling down, but also you can use it as an, as an interleave moment between two practices. For example, if you're training um, score, I'm gonna say something very easy, um, creating chances from the wide areas. So you're doing 10 minutes, you're doing your practice, then you go into the skill box and then you go into your practice again. So to make sure that your brain switch on and switch off again to the same practice. So the skill box is always there, only where they implement it is completely them and it's variable. I mean, then have you brought in some additional staff to support the delivery of that? I mean, that was my question. It's difficult. But I've, I've, been, I've been a coach working in an environment for 10 years, five years or 20 years, wherever. And we have never done any stuff like that. So maybe there's, there's maybe there's an information grab. You know, if I'm trying to deliver Kreuz and step overs and, you know, flip flaps and that sort of thing. Uh, maybe is, is that a challenge? Just what, you know, to, to get that detail. Um, you, see, you see, you see, of course, you see. Um, I truly believe that ev like every player is different, every coach is different. Um, so you see some coaches adapt the skill box immediately and you see it's like they, they, they make their own skill box and they implement it and they deliver it exactly the way we want it to live. Other coaches are more struggling with it. They feel uncomfortable by creating energy because of course the skill box needs to be high energy and you want to be up at them at all the times and they don't know which skills they can use and implement. Um, so that will take time to make the skill boxes exactly how we want them to be, because it needs to be high energy, the amount of touches needs to be high, needs to be variable. We want to do a lot of different skills that improve the ankle, hip, and um, knee flexibility. But also we add a juggling because we believe that juggling um, also improves the total ball con body ball control. Um, so the ideal skill box, the result, again, there is no one way that the ideal skill box, I think almost doesn't exist because every coach is different. It only needs to have some characteristics. It needs to be high energy. The amount of touches needs to be high and it needs to be fun. So those three things needs to be there. But you so will deliver it probably different than I will deliver it. And I will do it different than another coach delivered. We only want to make sure that it's a high amount of touches, that it improves the total ball body control and that it's fun. Yeah, that makes interesting. Sense. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. So, what, what, so what then? What are your, what are your targets? What are your talk about KPIs early? I mean, what are your, what, what, what's, what's your short term, long, medium term, long term targets? How are you going to judge if you've had a, been a success there at ranges? I'm coming back to a previous podcast of you. I listened to the podcast of um, the director of Leeds, and who's saying oh, yeah. that? Who, who is saying um, that you can't pick KPIs on uncontrollable things because he said this is the amount of players we want to bring to our first team, for example. That can, yeah. that can be a KPI, but that's something we can't control. What, what I can control is, can we maximize the implementation of the way we want to train from day to day? So my KPI is that every session I'm going outside on the pitch is delivered exactly how we want to deliver. So that's, that's the main KPI. The second KPI is, um, can we maximize the potential of every place? And that's something we will never measure. So it's not really like an indicator because we can't measure, but can we really maximize how, how big the tree will grow? We never know, but can we make sure that we make the biggest tree that the player can possibly be? Can the player become the best player he can possibly be? And we will never know how good that can become, but can we create an environment day to day, day in, day out, where every player can maximize his own potential? So is the behavior of the coach exactly um, how we want them to coach, how we want them to be? Is every session delivered in the way a range of training is delivered. Is every session based on the individual? Is every game based on development instead of winning? 
So just more, go more in depth. So if you talk to me on the short term, this is for me so important. Is our program that we create, a day-to-day -day program, the best possible program that is it lift um, by our coaches is really implemented the training principles, the way to train, what to train from day to day. So that's in short term for me, the most important thing. Um, and on a long term, I'm not gonna say an amount of numbers that we want to do in the first team because you will never know and you, you can't select an amount of numbers. The only thing I want to make sure is that they are numbers because I believe that we have players in the academy at the moment with a huge, huge potential. So if we combine the short-term KPI, the implementation of how we want to train in the best possible way, and the medium-term KPI producing good players, I think that will be an automatically outcome because what we're doing day to day, I believe is based on experience, is based on size, is based on data, and is based on some very good people. So if we can keep pushing the way we're doing it today, and a short-term ambition is implementing our training philosophy and methodology in the best possible way, our second KPI, producing players, I'm not going to say an amount, will be automatically the outcome of what we're doing today. And I assume it's also, I mean, you know, like you said, creating an identity, like, look, that that's the Rangers team. They play like a Rangers team. That looks like a Rangers player. You know, that I was talking about a lot of that stuff, you know, when working in clubs where we did a lot of ball masks, you can tell players who do a lot of ball masks, like you talked about the hips, flexibility, the movement, the way they, they just move differently, particularly in this country in England or UK. Uh, so I suppose that's really important as well as it's having that, you know, that consistent blueprint, no pun intended as the Rangers, but all the way through the academy say so that looks, you know, that's the Rangers way almost. 100%, 100%. It's exactly the Rangers way and the Rangers way. And <clears throat> the Rangers way, again, is more in how we do things and not especially in the outcome because the outcome, we can't control the outcome. We can't control if we win in the weekend, we can control the, 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 the amount of players. We can control that we will produce players and I will make sure, and I am sure that we will produce players, but we can say an amount of players. So our blueprint needs to create an identity in terms of um, how we want to play, um, the behaviors, but also what type of players we want in the academy, which skill set does every player needs to have at the end. So, um, and again, for me, the fastest way as a head of coaching to develop players is to develop coaches. That's why the CPD calendar is so important. Um, and that's why, but again, there's so many interesting people in our building that I just want to connect the dots within the building because there's so much knowledge in the building. Michael Beal has been there. So a lot of people are influenced by them and they have knowledge. So I want to, I use them in the CPDs. Um, but the blueprint from day to day needs to be there. And the blueprint is a combination of how we train our training principles and what we train. And if you, if you, the summary of those two things, what we train, how we train, make sure that we have a clear idea, a clear methodology or a clear blueprint through our academy. And what about yourself? It's like a head of coaching. And what sort of head of coaching are you? Are you on the grass quite a lot? Are you working with players? Are you getting involved in sessions? Or are you more the managing, just looking over and overseeing everything? I think a combination, a combination of all. Once you're in the role, in the beginning of the role, I said to myself, I want to be on the pitch as much as possible. But of course, as you know, and as everybody knows in the football environment, um, a lot of projects popping up and um, I like creating new projects. I like in creating new things. Um, so what makes that, um, I'm not always there on the pitch. I try to be there as much as possible. I also um, like to deliver sessions by myself. I'm there on game days, on the bench, next to the bench, with the coaches. Um, I like to reflect with coaches. Every coach has his development plan. Um, so we reflect a lot with coach. We have the coach reports. So um, I try to be there as much as possible on the pitch, but I believe that my role is more asking the right questions in the right moment. Um, again, I'm not the head of coaching with the biggest football brain who is going to tell exactly what to do. I believe in giving responsibility to coaching because again, like every player has his own identity, also every coach has his own identity. And if you want to get the best out of people, I believe you need, the best, you need to become the best version of yourself and not the best, the best version of me. So what I want to do is stimulate coaches by asking the right questions and make them conscious of what they're doing day to day and why are you doing this and is this how we want to do it and is can you do this in another way and how you can do this and but those questions making them based not on sub subjectivity in terms of going to the pitch and saying this is not what we want to do and he said yeah this is what we want to do making my question based on numbers that's why the objective coach reports where we have numbers of what type of behavior is for me so so important on the other hand 
for me, is just creating an inspiring environment where I want to bring people together, an open environment where there's space for dialogue, space for discussion. I want to have everybody's opinion. We are we honest with each other. We are open with each other. It's a safe environment where you can try, where you can experiment on the pitch. I think um, we want to be different. We want to be leading. We want to have the best academy. Um, and of course, we can be we can ambitious. We are rangers. We want to be a, a, one of the best academies in the world. So we need to be different. We want to do we want to do things different, and that's what we are doing. And sometimes we will do things that maybe not work, but at the end we've tried. And the only way to be better um, is to make mistakes. So um, I want to get the best out of my people. I want to give autonomy. I want to create a safe environment where everybody can be themselves to become the best coach they can be, so they can develop the best players um, who they can be. And I miss you just like Glasgow as, as a city. What's that like in terms of recruitment? Is there much difference when you con compare and contrast that to the cities in Belgium and that sort of thing, many sort of inner city areas, um, getting those inner city ballers? 100% so. And I think in general, if I compare, if um, I talk about the talent pool, um, we talk about sometimes you have some genetic advantages. If you talk about fast finders, if you talk about the body, the untrainable things. Um, mm. And if you see to the Belgian national team, I think immigration has also a huge role what improves the talent pool of Belgium. What's a very, very good thing, by the way, not only in football, but also in society, the immigration part makes sure that, that we, we need to live together, that we, that we understand the difference between people. And I think if I see Scotland in general, the immigration part is not as big as it was in Belgium. So if you just compare the type of players in the academies of Belgium and in the academies of Scotland, it's completely different. Um, so immigration, um, I believe that an academy is a, is a mirror of the society. So if you mm. see the academies in Belgium, there are a lot of players with an immigration background. If I see academies in Scotland in, in general, but not only on the pitch, but also beside the pitch, if I take a look at coaches, we don't have a lot of coaches with an immigration background. And if you see in Belgium, well, a lot of coaches with an immigration background and a lot of players with an immigration background, because that, that's just how society is evolved. So, but that also means that the genetics are different. It's given mm. it's, and, and you don't need to look that far, but if you see the physical ability of Romelu Lukaku, for example, I don't see that much in Scotland because I think we are high up in the UK, what makes sure that we, we don't have a lot of that immigration. So that was for me a very, very important thing. Mm. A very interesting, interesting thing, not an important thing, an interesting thing. Yeah, yeah, very, yeah, it's very interesting. It's funny because I was talking to the, um, change up to it, when the Ajax, the uh, head of recruitment of Ajax when I was at Chelsea on a tournament, he's talking about the, the talent pool in, in the inner city areas and the Belgium cities, you know, those the working class areas, the playground areas, and that sort of thing. As we know, like you can say in London, South London, that sort of thing, and those sort of hotbeds of natural it's, talent of players, yeah. players may play too much of, you know, yeah. that sort so of we thing. Mostly, we, mostly, we mostly call it natural talent, but it's just players who develop themselves on the street. I think in Belgium, mm. we have really still some areas where a lot of people need, need we call it, we, we fast to call it bad areas, but they are just areas where people, um, um, constantly playing on the street. And if we compare the amount of play in Belgium on the streets to the amount of play in Scotland on the streets, it's such a big difference. So just the amount of hours, the amount of our playing hours, playing against bigger opponents on the streets, against smaller opponents, and they need to make sure that they don't run against the wall or they don't break their angle when there's something on the ground. I think in Scotland, the, the amount of street football is just not there. And it's also part of the, the immigration. There's also a, a result in Belgium of immigration because we had a lot of people who need to live together in very tight, tight spaces. But that makes sure that it's like almost like a natural pool that starts existing. Um, what 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 helps play develop a lot? Yeah, same uh, France have the same sort of done a similar sort of you know hotbed of talent. In those those working class areas very interesting. So what about yourself then? What what's uh, what's what you know what's your aspirations in the future? Obviously you know uh, you know you've had a great career already. What what's what's the ultimate ambitions for yourself? Yeah. The first and far most important thing is that the moment I don't like things anymore is the moment I start questions too much. So in everything I will do, I want to make sure that I really, really like what I'm doing. I always use the phrase, I'm all in all the times. And I think you only can be all in if you really like what you're doing. Mm. I don't want to work at 70%. I don't want to work at 80%. I want to be all in at all the times. I want to be all in for the players, for the coaches, for the environment, for the club. 
But the only way to be all in is to make sure that you like what you're doing. So how my future looks like, I don't know. I just want to make sure whatever I will do and whatever I do, I like a lot. And I want to make sure that I enjoy every step of my process. I'm 26 at the moment and I will never know. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I, know, I don't know where my direction is going, what I will be in the future. The only thing I want to make sure is one, that I get challenged because I like a challenge. Two, that I like the people I work with because I want to be in a good environment. And three, that I just like what I'm doing day to day, day in, day out. That's the only way I'm all in. And if you want to be all in, again, you need to make sure that you enjoy the process. And enjoy doesn't make it easy because of course I'm facing challenges and uh, you're, you're living abroad in Scotland. The weather is not always nice and, and I'm alone in here. And so that doesn't mean that it's, that it, that it's always easy but I really enjoy the challenge and I enjoy the environment and I enjoy the people. And in every decision I will make in the future, I want to make sure that I can be all in. And to all in, you need to enjoy it and you need to have the right people around you and you need to have a challenge. And, and what advice would you give to a young aspiring coach who wants to have a, a, a big career in the game like yourself? <clears throat> I think make sure you work for free. Make sure you work for free. Make hours. Don't chase the money because as a youth coach, there is no money. Make sure you make free hours. Make sure you're on the pitch. Make sure you ask questions. Make sure you're open. Make sure you find people who inspire you. Make sure you, you, you deliver hours. You're on the pitch with the guys. Make sure you listen every podcast you can possibly listen. Read books. Um, ask questions all the time. Um, don't, be, um, don't be afraid to make mistakes. Um, just, just, just enjoy the process. Again, be all in. And if you want to be all in, make sure you like it. Surround yourself with, with good people. Surround yourself with mentors. Like I think in life, a mentor is so, so important. I always say young, it's, it's, it's a quote from, from uh, I think, Pepe Landers. Young people don't need criticism. Young people need role models. Um, and for me, that was um, very important because that's the moment I went to Michael Bale. There's a moment I went to Zurich to meet Timo Janowski. There's a moment I surrounded myself online and offline with people who mm. inspire me day to day. And then at the end, the most important thing is don't be a copy of someone else. I think, I think Twitter, Instagram, social media gives us a platform where so much valuable online. But the danger of that is that you just start copying what everybody else is doing. And that's a very dangerous thing because... The difference between a method and a methodology is so big. And I'll give you an example. Try to make sure that you give your own methodology. A methodology is takes the context in common. So I and myself are working in this country, have my ideas, but this country has this cultural environment, and this is the history, and this is this is a methodology. You bring everything together. And the method is just this is what, for example, IX is doing. I'm gonna copy this in this environment. That will not work. And the beautiful, the most beautiful example is, for example, the Islam how the Islam is practiced completely in the south of the world can be practiced in the same way in the north, in the UK or in Belgium. But it's exactly a method copying how the Islam is practiced in Saudi Arabia, for example. You can practice it in the same way in Belgium or in the UK. So that's a method and that, that will start for clashes. So make sure you create your own methodology. So be yourself, be influenced by interesting people, respect where you are and where you will go, but make sure you have an identity and that you stay you and you create a mix of the best methods and they create a mix of... And on the other hand, it's a thin line between... Because I also like the phrase, still like an artist, because if someone else is something doing very, very good, there's nothing wrong with copying it. But it's like a very thin line being be, be yourself, still like an artist, respect the context, respect your environment. So I think the word methodology versus the word method, don't copy a method, create a methodology. And maybe the methodology can be influenced by a certain method, of course. If that makes sense. Christian, right. Absolutely. Fantastic. And then last question, probably the most important one. Scotland's obviously known for so many things, famous for many things, but what about the cuisine there? Do you have maybe haggis, iron brew, or the deep fried Mars bar, the specialities there? What's, what's your thoughts on those uh, classics? I'm going to avoid haggis as long as possible. The yeah. iron brew I start liking. Yeah. Um, but I need to be honest, I'm here now for almost three months. I need to explore myself more to the cultural um, things in Scotland. But I really, really like to be here. Lovely. Listen, Zeb, thanks very much, mate. It's been fantastic. Uh, thanks for taking the time. No problem. Thank you. 
thanks for tuning in to the MyPersonalFootballCoach.com Soccer Player Development Podcast. MyPersonalFootballCoach.com's Dynamic Ball Mastery Program is the world's leading online individual technical training program, proven and developed at the highest level in the English Premier League. Sign up now to train like the pros and take your game to the next level. Master the ball, master the game.